Um, all right. Well, welcome back, y'all. Welcome back. Hanging again with Kay Lou. Um, and today we're mixing it up a little bit. So I think uh, feedback wise, uh, you know, it's been very positive. Obviously, we're, we're continuing to rock the content stuff, but um, the hope was to make it a little more snackable, as they say in the industry. So more consistent content that is easier to digest. So we're uh, sticking with monthly issues and we've got actually I'll share my screen real quick. We've got four beats now um, that are a little more structured. So we've got a deal teardown, which is what we're going to be jamming on today. And then we'll uh, next Saturday will be an operating concept. You're going to get the newsletter in your inbox on Saturday mornings uh, for the maniacs that spend time reading this stuff on Saturday morning. <laughs> um, so next Saturday will be an operating concept. The following Saturday will be an OKR teardown. The following Saturday will be a portfolio performance wrap. Uh, we just wrapped on a big sprint, so the performance wrap should be pretty thorough. And then the OKR teardown, we're going to be looking at UGC playbooks, which I think are very interesting. Uh, but today we got a software suite for wedding venues with 98K ARR. Um, and I, I take it you had some time to, to pull your notes together, Kev? Oh, yeah. Variable snack bites here. I love it. Nice. Well, I think right out of the gate, um, 98K is on the low end for us. Um, and I, I think that's like a big decision point for folks that are getting into the Mac, micro SaaS acquisition game is kind of which tranche do you want to play? Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're relying on the business for income, personal income to achieve. And that's kind of a, a conversation around like kind of buying back your time where it's like, hey, I'm going to acquire this business. I'm going to live off the net income of the business. And then I'm going to active. And then I, I'm the number one ringleader, you know, contributing and making the business more valuable. But it's ultimately a way to buy escape velocity, as we call it. Uh, yep. But 98K is obviously well below that. In the, and when we start to step into, I think, margin wise, it's even thinner, but there's some interesting stuff. So headline here, software suite for wedding and event venues doing 98K and ARR. We've got a very sexy uh, fade gradient <laughs> here. That took me a little while in Canva, getting, getting smoother though. Um, and the headline <laughs> is profitable SaaS with 86 in trailing 12 month revenue and 33K and trailing 12 month private that, uh, I'm sorry, profit that helps wedding event venues bring their entire operation into one software suite. Huge TAM, incredible opportunity to become the market leader in this niche growing industry. So out of the gate, what stands out to you, Amigo? Yeah, so out of the gate, I mean, while the software itself sounds like, hey, this could be a game winning like deal right here, the margins are just too thin. And the fact that it only has 5% year over year growth and it's operated by two people, it means it feels like one, we're going to be operating from a place of scarcity. So in case anything happens or blows up, worst case scenario, we may not necessarily have the funds and we all have to put our heads down to kind of figure this thing out. So while it may be a good deal, the revenue level just scares the heck out of me because bootstrapping and operating from uh, a place of scarcity, it's tough on most entrepreneurs and everyone doesn't want to keep jumping from one grind to the next grind. So the grind scares me, man. Dude, uh, yeah, <laughs> this totally. kind of business. Well, I think there's, uh, and I've written a little bit about comfort zones um, and I've had some pretty deep combos with some super sharp folks. And it's like, you're always looking for 60% comfortable, 20% weird, 20% straight abyss. Okay, like <laughs> a cliff into the nowhere and you're just yep, just nose right? dive <laughs> and it's like oh we got it so that's kind of from an operating perspective and i think there's a, a, a obviously a spectrum of stress that's helpful and uh when your back's against the wall and margins are this thin and things go wrong and you got to worry about paying bills for the tech stack vendors obviously we wouldn't have any kind of payroll to meet here um so i'm with you so the headline like right out of the gate it's like that's not a lot of revenue um, and for us, and I think we have established that we want to be playing at minimum 20K MRR, which is about 250K in ARR. Um, and that's a function of just like the, the, the burden operating wise headcount. Mm -hmm. And if we think about core headcount, that's engineering and product, that's rev ops, um, that's customer support. But I would say like the most bre like skeleton crew ever is engineering and support, right? You got yeah, to continue I was going to say it's really support and engineering. That's it. <laughs> that's it. And then ideally you layer in some rev ops there because that's, you know, kind of the, the data and the systems that make the machine go or, or give you operating leverage over time. Um, exactly. So the thing that spooks me is like, oh shit, 86K 
and he's asking an 8.7x and we'll go into comparables here which you know god bless him if he thinks the, the value's there fight for it you know but it's like all right and we're using leverage in our deals so let's just say you know if we take a 300k loan a 400k loan to buy the business that debt service on a monthly basis is, is going to be 5k or so yeah so, so it's like <laughs> it's like we don't have enough money uh, or we can't make this right. deal work so then you got to go straight equity and that obviously has impacts on the returns um, but I, I did like the, 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 the team size with two. I, I think that speaks to the kind of the operating rigor and the systems that are in place. Um, and, and the things that stood out to me on the positive side, and this, it's, it's always interesting, right? Because some people look at stuff and they're like, Ooh, 5% growth. I look at it and I'm like, yeah, nice. I'm like, cause we, we are the growth people, growth. right? Yep, like when, yep, there's, yep. <laughs> when the growth is slapping, it's like, so what do we do and why are they selling? We just come in and kind of ride the Bronco into the sunset. Like, I don't really understand that. I mean, that sounds great, but then let's buy another company that we have to work on, you know? Um, exactly. So 5% 5, 5 growth. And that implies probably one channel organic, probably good word of mouth flywheel right. going for them, but probably no paid acquisition, no data driven kind of targeted a acquisition. And then uh, the, the thing that stood out to me too is product tech stack. So react very modern front end Firebase AWS. So this is a, a modern stack, um, even though it was founded in 2017, which is, you know, time's getting away from me, six years old. I'm, I mean, hey, um, and it's still very um, cost effective because if you think about it, these three, they're the most cost effective solutions to stand up any application with online today. And 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 lean and mean, right? I mean, you can iterate, yeah. ship features, you can move fast and, and good data exactly. analytics on, on the, or plays nice with product usage stuff so we can understand which users are doing what and start to understand the value metrics, et cetera. Uh, cumulative yeah. score 2.58 out of four. We're, we're typically looking for, 3.1 or two or above as like a baseline. Um, and so that's kind of where we started. So some of the strengths that uh, just the headline ones that I, I touched on in my thing were, I like the play of the platform versus a point solution. I think, you know, we've all gone hard at that. I think we kind of just were living during that era where, you know, if you think about just society at large, industry, business, the economy period is adopting technology and, and the digital transformation. A lot of that velocity was pulled forward with COVID. There's been tons written about that. Um, yep. But in that scenario, right, it's like, hey, I'm running a consulting business. I need to send an invoice. Okay. Mm -hmm. I got an invoice thing. All right. Uh, now I need to manage projects. Okay. I've got a project thing. Uh, now I need something to talk to my team and figure out what these deliverables are doing and how we go about that and like socialize content with the customer. Okay, now we've got like uh, another thing. And pretty quick, you're like, all right, I take my customers out of this thing and I put them in this thing and then I send them the invoice and then they send me the thing and then I go over <laughs> then here. Then you realize how update. siloed it is. <laughs> and you're like, oh. <laughs> and so there's becomes this breaking point where the point solutions create more friction and pain. And people are like, man, mm -hmm. I'm just going to go back to how we were doing it. This is this is now well, owning me instead of me owning the software, right? A very common dynamic. Yep. So this is a textbook point versus platform play. We mm -hmm. saw it a lot, or I spent a lot of my career in uh, HCM. And in that category, it was, we have applicant tracking, we have onboarding, we have benefit administration, we have... Yeah. Talent time management, off like, yeah, time off tracking, uh, maternity, paternity, employee leave. handbook, like policies yes. and administration. It's so much when it comes into human capital. It's like, it's like an ER people for people. And you're like, whoa. <laughs> whoa. And so it was like, cool. And then you had like the, uh, God, what was the one that exploded in a spectacular fashion where kids were like shooting cinnamon whiskey in the stairwell? Uh, it was an <laughs> HR tool and they went after, it was the Parker Conrad founded it. Oh, dude. At risk um, of saying the wrong name on this video. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I can't remember what it's called, but they, they made a killing because they rolled up a bunch of stuff. Namely yeah. came in because the incumbents, it was like ADP for payroll. Uh, then they expanded into an HR suite. Long story short, I like this play. Uh, right. I think you got to be careful when you're timing it, but it's like, hey, we're thinking about a tech maturity curve. This category is here. They're adopting some stuff. So we've, we've seen kind of a willingness to adopt technology from the ICP, from the, the segment itself. There's some point solutions in play where's the platform? And then let's just go hard. And the pain point is very straightforward. Siloed data, friction between your shit, no system of record to actually understand what's going on. You can't get cohesive data. You're flying blind, you're switching systems. And people are like, yes, yes, yes. Give me the platform, I'll buy it. And it's like done, away we go, right? So um, this seems to be that, right? So for like venue management, wedding venue management, it's probably the exact case. Hey, I'd like to use it's your venue for my wedding. They're like, cool. 
you know, fill out this questionnaire, give us more information. Cool. We'll send you a proposal. Cool. You're here. This is what the day of show looks like. Great. Now we're going to send you email marketing to keep you engaged. Hopefully you have a graduation party here in the future. Let's try to turn you into a repeat customer, et cetera. So this seems to be bread and butter down the middle. I like that. Anything to add? Yeah, no, I'm I'm right there with you. Seems pretty industry agnostic. As long as you have a venue, this platform seems pretty um, uh, tied in with you. I like it. Groovy. So then into modern product stack, tech, product tech stack. And I, and I think the context here is important. Um, what's what's the most common case with micro SaaS companies? Tech debt or none? Always tech debt. Are you kidding me? That's We wouldn't have a job if there wasn't any tech debt. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, figure like a, a rule of thumb, probably 20 to 40% of the product needs to be rewritten or addressed to, to, mm -hmm. to, to prevent any scale issues, meaning... We're going to grow the shit out of this. We're going to add a bunch of users. And they're like, oh, if you add any users, the back end's going to topple over and everything's going to go south. And it's like, all right, well, that's a problem. Or, you know, we know that we need to kind of build a few of these features to get really competitive with the competitive set, or we need to build these integrations. You're like, eh, we can't really do that. So that's number hard. one thing is tech debt is typically a bottleneck to growth. Mm -hmm. And it's something that is very hard to navigate because it's like, all right, do we fix the car so that it runs smoother? Or do we, you know, put a new stereo in when everybody loves a new stereo? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and those trade-offs are so hardcore. Um, so anyway, I think the reason the modern product tech stack stands out here is because it's not very common, right? Bootstrap founders are like, yo, elbow grease, bubble gum, duct tape. Right. Get, just keep, get, keep it going. Keep it alive. Let's keep generating some revenue and let's live to fight another day. Um, cool. So let's move on from that one. Pricing models. Okay, Lou, what's your favorite pricing model, buddy? My pricing model, hybrid. So all usage base. Yeah, you have to pay a base rate to get access and we price you based on all of the other activities you complete once you're in the software. Totally. And we were chatting about this, like the holy grail, or it's hard to contain value with software, right? right. And there's all different. And it's like the convention was usually seat-based, license-based, and then some users extract tremendous value some users maybe log in every once in a while, users share their licenses. Right. So it's like, ugh, like we, we're not doing a very good job in terms of the value chain of actually capturing the value that we're creating. And so ideally you move towards something where it's like, hey, you're gonna use this SaaS, it's gonna make you more successful and we want a chunk of that incremental success. So it, at its root, it feels like a rev share, right? And Exactly, the way we wanna position it is, so exactly like a rev share, but for someone that doesn't understand a refshare model, they're thinking, oh man, this is a really dope contingent plan. They don't win until I win. And that's what you want people to think about with a usage-based pricing model. Exactly. And another way to think, or maybe a concept to wrap around that is like it scales linearly. So yep. as you succeed up into the right, well, this is back, maybe backwards, <laughs> up into <laughs> the right, um, your, your success is our success. Our long-term incentives are aligned. You don't feel like you're getting price gouged. We don't feel like you're exploiting us. Everybody's happy. Exactly. Right? Um, and there's some really good stuff. Tom Tongas distills this very simply, and he, he thinks about it in terms of like tariffs. So two-part tariff is what you're talking about, which is like a pay to play. This is a platform thing. You pay some fee. And then there's a toll booth element, which is like as exactly. you incrementally get more success. And then the other beautiful part there too is it overcomes a lot of the initial barrier to entry or friction for new accounts. Because mm. OG enterprise stuff is like, hey, we're going to run this sales process. We're going to do these totally configured demos and we're going to promise this business impact and then we're going to implement it. And then a year later, maybe it's there. Right? Whereas <laughs> yeah, this, one, <laughs> this one's like, okay, you know, like you want to take a bite of the apple. Isn't that good? Great. You want to take more bites of the apple? Great. And, oh, the apple's gone. Here's another one. <laughs> and, and the part about it that I love is, you know, on the back end, as product managers, we're always looking and say, okay, where can we create the most value for people? Now you have a way to just target exactly the features that are being so used by so many uh, uh, groups of power users. You can say, okay, let's interview those people and say, okay, what else can we do here to just move the lever? Or is this feature just so perfect that we shouldn't touch it at all? And let's look at some other features we can make as perfect as that one. It, it just gives the value creation conversations just so much more validity. Totally. And I think, so this one, what I found to be clever was based around events, right? The alternative could have been venue, uh, operators, management teams. It could <laughs> number have been of invoices. Whole, yeah, number of invoices. <laughs> it could have been a bunch of stuff. And it's like, yo, however many events you do per year, presumably 
you're going to extract as much value from this as, you know, more events, more value, because we're streamlining your stuff. We're giving you time and that, right? At the end of the day, everything's about saving time, saving money, or saving time is a way and, to create money or save And money. more data, so more retention. You can't just leave because we got all your shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Totally. So um, that was cool. And then we touched on this, uh, the light op operating model. I mean, I, I think it's, I'm not sure what the contractor situation is with this, with this firm, but two person headcount. That's lean and mean. That's systems. He must have his, his ducks in a, in a row. I mean, it's like, you've got playbooks, you've got operating procedure, you've got good process around data, which there's two sides of that coin, right? Cause it's like, it's a professional like operator. And I think what, what you hope for is a professional product person who knows the shit out of the market or kind of a repeat product person. And they're like, hey, we got it to this point. We're not necessarily savage when it comes to operating a business, when it comes to leading a business, when it comes to systems, mm -hmm. procedure, repeatability, operating leverage, et cetera. So this is, the good side of this is like, cool, it can be done. The bad side of this is like, they might be doing it, which means we aren't having, gonna have an opportunity to do it and create some value in the business in the form of efficiency. Right. I'm totally right there with you. It seems like they're already spanking it. Like how much more can we spank? Like where, where's that squeeze, you know, where's that lever yeah. that we can find? Well, I can tell you, we're not going to get it south of two people on, on a fractional I mean, basis. Right. I yeah. Mean, my gut says there's some contractors that's not being mentioned in there. <laughs> yeah. Cause this would be, I mean, I think at most, and the rule of thumb too is in terms of ARR per headcount is you don't want to think about a full-time person until 250 K ARR. So they're obviously right. well away from that. So this is probably the founder who's has income from some other source and then maybe a developer who's international and he's got them on the books because he's trying to offset his tax burden. There's some different strategies there, but all right. Risk factors. We spoke about this one, um, man, if you're flipping houses and you pay a huge premium on the house, is it harder to make money on the house or is it easier to make money on the house? It's harder to make money on the house. So I think it's like split the atom too. It's like, oh my God, private equity. It's like this crazy thing and you have to go to business school and oh my God. And it's like, well, at the end of the day, you're buying something at a lower price. You do something to make it more valuable and you sell it. Simple as that, right? You make the asset more valuable and, and there's multiple. Buy low, sell high, simple. And, and, and multiple is a, a function of a lot of stuff but one for sure is growth. And when we get into comps, we'll look at how this deal compares to a lot of the other deals that we have access to, to or just visibility into. But um, so that's, this is basically a deal breaker. Um, yeah. So, but that doesn't mean we kill the deal, right? This would be, hey, let's have a conversation. I mean, I think we've agreed that this is a deal we'd pass on because it's below a threshold where we want to play in terms of just baseline ARR. Mm -hmm. We obviously got to stay open-minded. We don't want to uh, constrict the, the aperture for deal flow such that we don't look at deals where it's like, oh, this is a no, it's like, eh, okay, the, the valuation is a problem. That means let's have a conversation with the seller and let's have them rationalize the valuation in their view. And I think yeah. based on what we've spoken about, I think this is probably like a kind of a venture pitch where it's like product is primed and greased. We've got some customers that love us. We haven't hit the growth thing, pay a premium, come in here and you're basically paying for upside. Um, which is a function of a whole bunch of st uh, stuff. And that's, I mean, I don't know. I think that's very debatable, but I think from our perspective, when we would just, the, the comps argument is kind of the de facto way to value something where it's like, hey, you want to sell this house for a million bucks. It looks like similar and it doesn't have a garage and it doesn't have a swimming pool and it doesn't have a kid's room. Every other house trading at a million bucks has all three of those things and they have way better landscaping. How are you getting to this valuation? And he might say, you know, we've got the, we've got a Benihana kitchen. <laughs> and you'll be like, damn, all right, that's worth, that's, that's cool. Yeah, all right, yeah. let's, you know, let's talk. Um, so valuations, uh, very ambitious um, on the revenue levels. And then the thing that really spooked me, white glove was mentioned a lot. White glove scares me. Um, how well does human implementation scale? It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. It comes down to proper SOPs, which someone has to own to continuously update. And then you have to have someone to follow that SOP and execute it. And then there's the risk factor of that person just decides to not look at the SOP and do it their own way. And now everything's going downhill. Human capital does not scale the way we want. And there's always a higher burn than we budget for. Or well, the other thing, right, if you think about unit economics, we want something where our costs scale on a certain trajectory. Mm -hmm. that is not attached to revenue. And so said differently, 
when you have costs baked into every new customer, because the beautiful thing about software is once it's built, how much does it cost to give to a new customer? Uh, it's, well, it's, it's, it's a unit of scale. It starts to, you know what well, I mean? It's, it's it costs you up. less with most yeah, more customers. Less over time. Yeah, less over time, yeah. but it's simply put, it's delivered via the internet. Exactly. We don't have to mail anything. We don't have to package anything. We don't have to carry any inventory. It's free cost of serve, right? Streamlined. Um, so in this one, it's like for every unit of new customer, we're stacking costs. And then you'll make that up because of the recurring revenues when you start to think about customer acquisition costs and long, lifetime value. Uh, yeah. But this is not good. And then the other thing too, and this one's not quite as obvious, is there a very consistent, predictable number of new customers that sign on? Mm. Right. Where okay. It's, where it's like, hey, we're going to onboard three customers a, a month and we need three implementation people. It's like, yeah. eh, this week we only got one new customer and we're paying these three implementation people. God damn it. You got to no. ramp up and down. This week we've got 10 new customers and these three people are totally overloaded, stressed out, burnt out. The experience for the customer is terrible. All the timelines are off. The budgets are off. This is a disaster. And so you play this game where it's like, ee, 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 ee. <laughs> you're just like chasing yeah. this thing. And it's like, well, you know, let's forecast this. And it's like, you know, we don't have a glass oh, can you? or a magic ball. Yeah, totally. Exactly. If this was a business selling a physical product and you look at the line item for cost of goods sold, it's just all over the place. There's really no forecastability here. Totally. So any quick wins and opportunities? Um, I, I, I mean, I, I kind of kept this short and sweet. I mean, I, I think product seems to be tight. Obviously, we would diligence the hell out of that. Um, yeah, and to. competitive said this triple seat group is pretty impressive. Good critical mass of reviews on G2, three, you know, anything north of 100, 150, especially yeah. in kind of a niche market is interesting. 4.4 is obviously not bad. They won an award like the winter G2, whatever award. I, I was going to say, I have some familiarity with them. They actually own a large percentage of the market share for venue management software. And I was using them with a previous client before. Um, they were pretty much just offering um, curated uh, catering experiences. So they'll okay. bring out like a famous chef and then they'll teach you how to make certain dishes exactly like that chef. Or if you're uh, targeting a certain like health group that's aiming for a certain health lifestyle, say intermittent fasting, they would then cater like an experience on a weekend to teach you how to do intermittent fasting the right way, how to eat properly when you break your fast and when you're going on fast. And they use triple seats across all of their customers to manage a lot of the bookings. And it was totally. easy. And this makes a ton of sense, especially you know, the restaurant industry was pretty beat down after COVID and they're like, yeah, so they have to get creative. Yeah. They're like, people aren't dining like they used to, you know, there our takeout is ripping, but we're paying, you know, we're paying DoorDash 30%. They're taking us to the bank yep. and they're like, but at least we, you know, we're keeping the doors open. It's like, all right, well, what should we do with our space? It's like, Hey, yep. I don't know. Do you have any kids that want to do a birthday party? Is anybody graduating? Is there a proposal we could celebrate? And it's like, Oh, okay. So this, so I, get how triple C could have had some breakout as a function of their core customer needing to make better use and generate kind of new income streams for their assets, meaning the, the real estate yep. that they own and operate and have to pay a lease on. Um, so I looked at this and I was like, good side of the coin. They're hyper fixated on restaurants and hospitality. I think that gives us the space here with this firm to go attack wedding venues and, and kind of ancillary, you know, concert venues. I don't know. We would just play outside of restaurants and hospitality, but yep. then you start to think about, the differentiation between those verticals and it's like you know how different is a wedding venue than a restaurant and it's like I, you know i don't I'd know in the same venue and it's like all right cool so is triple c going to change a few landing pages and start you know buying some ads for wedding venues and they've got better product market fit across like the real kind of core pain points that aren't that distinct across the verticals right. triple c expands their machine to come after wedding venues and they've got some momentum Mm, you know, you how start robust little, is our product? Mm, Would they want to acquire yeah. it or just say, you know what, let's just let them go bust? <laughs> sure. Well, and I think that's an interesting thing too, right? Like begin with the end in mind where it's like, actually, let's go fixate, hyper fixate on weddings. And then let's turn around and flip it to triple C and let's just make an obvious no brainer. And we could inform a product roadmap that way. Like there's a lot of like, we're going to acquire this thing in the, the core part of the thesis is the exit strategy. And obviously you need to have some kind of exit strategy in mind, but it's like, Hey, we're going to get, we're going to build this for a strategic acquisition, go baby, go. And then you just hope that whatever you're doing is interesting enough where they don't think they can do it themselves, or they don't think that they'll just bleed you slowly and your customers will come over there anyway, and they'll just get them at a yep. discount. Um, so anywho, all right, into market comps, 
Um, so we, I did, I flexed up pretty big on, um, on our, or, oh, sorry, into market comps, not, not return scenarios. So if we're looking at, and we did 50 K to hundred K micro SAS ARR. Um, mm -hmm. so asking price, uh, was five Oh five. This one is obviously significantly higher. So we gave that two thumbs down revenue multiples, 5.29. This one is significantly higher. That's two thumbs down trailing 12, 12 month profits at 53 K. This is about uh, you know thirty to fifty percent lower. Like, ah, that could have been a double thumb down, <laughs> and then gro <laughs> and growth rate could have been a triple thumb down. Um, so yeah. a lot of thumbs down. That's a um, uh, quadruple thumbs down on <laughs> growth yeah, rate. A lot of thumbs down. Um, and then we look at the actual deal. Um, well, how about this? I would yeah. I would challenge that based on our investment thesis, the growth rate would actually be a zero thumbs down on the 5% because we want something that we can spank, not something that's already vibing, right? Agree, but uh, just in terms of comparables where it's like, again, here's the house. It's got this many bedrooms, this many garage car spots, bing, gotcha. bing, 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 and it's like, well, this, this is a bad comparable. Like none of this really adds up basically. Yeah, right? it doesn't like, At best you want like sideways thumbs, sideways thumbs, sideways thumbs, sideways thumbs. Yeah, and maybe some this would be more of an outlier in the group. Sure, or we would have to have crazy conviction on how to, <laughs> to, to, to rip this. And it's like, hey, this is a no brainer. And maybe that's a simple function of a quick conversation with the seller. And you're like, oh, got it, I'm clear. There is extraordinary value here, and it's not represented in some of these, you know, kind of conventional metrics that we use to measure this deal against others. Mm. You got See, it. now that's some interesting confidence because I would say not only it's a conversation with the seller, but it might also take us having some experience in the space to really know what levers to pull. Sure. Somebody else, I mean, if they own, or here's the situation, you know, this uh, triple seat might pay an 8x. Because they're like, boom, we're going to pull you in here and we're going to go from 20% yeah. market share to 35% market share. And we're going to round out our features. And that's where, you know, right. value just, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. So is <laughs> value. So value, right? It's just all about <laughs> that audience, right? And it's like, right. you know, who makes the most money selling water? Right. The dude in the Jeez, Sahara. Dude. Right. The right. Dude because the there's, an, there's an actual you demand thirsty? there. Yeah. Are you thirsty? I got some water. Or, or the, the, the woman on the, on the side of the highway selling roses the morning of Valentine's Day. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. I love that hustle. All right. Return scenarios. Purchase price 750. We're just kind of going with um, what the ask is, right? So that's an 8.7x entry multiple. And if we think about what we can do to expand multiple, it's usually a function of a, a lot of business things, but one that's very basic is growth, right? Growth rate is rewarded because people will pay a multiple because they think that that growth will continue and they're going to get greater cash flows back from the, from the asset in the future. But in micro, and then there's usually a discount, the smaller you go, where it's like, you know, if you're a 5 million ARR business, you're going to trade between five and 10. If you're a 10 million ARR business, you know, maybe eight and 12. So the bigger you get in the eyes of the investment uh, audience pretty, pretty, uh, I guess across the board, the bigger you are, the safer you are, you can command a greater multiple. You combine yeah. that with growth rate. You combine that with like four or five other usual suspects, uh, attributes, and then you can get there. But there's probably no situation where we could sell at a nine X or a 10 X. And we, and I think that that's, that logic is misguided because I'm like this micro SaaS business, you know, another one is doing 250 K and it's been spitting out a 50% net margin so you know it's generating five round numbers it's, you know it's 500k our business and it's generating 250k net income net profit and it's done that for two or three years i feel pretty good about that that's a pretty safe yeah. thing right like i don't really care that it's only 500k and maybe that's foolish we'll we'll find out um but anywho so very unlikely we will sling it for bigger than a 9x We'd ask the Keller, seller to carry back 10%, that's 75K. And we're going to just go nuts on the cash outlay on the equity and flex up from what, you know, typically we're trying to shoot for like 30, 40% up to 60%. And we're going to keep our, our steady Eddie three year hold period. So I, I just mapped out two scenarios. And again, for the audience, this is hard and fast, not super granular leveraged buyout financial modeling. We have a turnkey template that we use and it's, you know, we're trying to just rinse this. This is a point of trajectory with the, the uh, a viewpoint on the deal. Obviously, as we work through diligence, our model gets way more comprehensive. The assumptions get way more uh, complex, but here we've got 
established top quartile growth and median churn, that's 5% churn. And that's the median for, for MRR zero to 25K. And then uh, a 3% net growth rate. So if we establish top quartile growth and that top quartile growth is relative to median churn. So this is where it gets a little funny, right? Because it's like growth is a net function, right? So it's like if churn is 12%, I mean, churn obviously is the number one thing you want to optimize for, but if churn's 12% and you want to achieve top quartile growth, you got to get 15% right? Because we're talking about a, a net number here at the end of the day. Um, and then, man, I leaned out the operating uh, expenses hard. So I was like, all right, an engineer, a customer support rep, and then like kind of some rev ops. And let's hope we trade out a 6X. Um, because again, we want to like, churn would be a big uh, driver of the valuation. And then the other scenario, and if we do rip that, we're looking at 2.2K, and free cash flow on average a year. So like Kubelet, if it was like 6K and we're running like basically net margin, uh, net negative margin the first year after death service. Yep. Break even is at exit and cash on cash return is 2%. Gross proceeds about 680K. And then, you know, what's funny is that relative to, and obviously the downside of micro is we're going to turn 448K into 680 after you get paid your 448. Um, so in conventional private equity standards, a 2.52 MOIC and a 35% IRR is great. That's pro probably top quartile yeah. for a lower middle market buyout shop. But everyone's like, all right, all the brain damage I had to subscribe to the investment, you're sending me these updates. And you know, we, <laughs> as we've spoken about, it's kind of tonnage out. They're like, nah, it's probably not worth my time. So we, our, our, our return metrics need to be very significant because we're kind of playing with nickels and dimes relative to institutional investors that are rocking lower middle market buyouts, right? So this is like, we look at this and it's like, this is not, this is unacceptable because these things need to be extraordinary to make micro SaaS an interesting asset class or sub sub asset class. Gotcha. Cool. Next one, maintain relative growth. So this is now we're maintaining that 8% growth rate. We're, we're and this, and you can almost kind of think about this over time too, where it's like, let's get in, let's get growth buzzing, strip out as much cost as we possibly can. Churn is there and churn takes a long time to fix. Okay. And then these scenarios could kind of stack together. Okay, now we've got this growth rate. Cool, let's solve for churn, which is very hard. <laughs> and it's like, okay, so now let's get into, oh, and that's supposed to say top quartile, but 2% um, churn. Now we, we maintain 8% growth rate. We've got the same staff. 5% net would be rewarded in terms of a factor for the multiple. All right, 82K free cash flow a year. We're still not going to make our money back until I exit. 18% cash on cash per year. 2.6 million in gross proceeds. And now we've got, you know, the moics and the IRs that, that we need to see. Yeah. All, all to say, this is interesting. There's almost no way that we can make it work. <laughs> uh, and it's not that practical, but this is an interesting deal to look at. Um, and it was very worth the exercise. Yeah, no, it's definitely that. worth the exercise. Um, <clears throat> well, let me again, ask you, like, we got to get to the point. It's like, do you do the deal? Do you, <laughs> so, do you send an LOI? You talk the to scorecard the says no. Uh, my gut would say, like, honestly, what I would do, how I would approach it would be a conversation with the seller and say, we got to get down from the asking price. Like the, yeah. the make me believe. multiple, like. <laughs> make me a believer. Where, where's the Benihana kitchen, dude? And exactly. I need a fire, and I need a fireman's pole from the top to the bottom. That's cool as shit. And the kid, you know, and the, the kid's bedroom has a trampoline in it. <laughs> exactly. Like, Show me where you see the growth potential here. <laughs> yeah, totally. All right. Well, my dude, I think that's, I think that's a wrap. Anything that's to wrap. add? No, this was, uh, I can't wait for the next, uh, the next part. Um, I'm enjoying these snack bites. I think this is a way better way to approach these kind of deal tear down. So it gives everyone a little bit to just dive into and then like, yeah, that all makes sense versus just hitting them all at once. But this was a great man. 30 minute snack bite. Let's do this every week. Beauty, beauty. Well, thank you for running and gunning with me, my man. I know you got a lot of action. Um, of course, man. Cool. Go get them today. And uh, I'm going to go have something to eat. <laughs>